Good morning, members of parliament, support staff, radio listeners, TV viewers, those following via social media, and members of the media. Welcome to this Central Committee meeting number 41 of today, Wednesday, August 17, 2022. I want to give a special welcome to the Honorable Minister of Finance, Mr. Ardwell Arian, and his support staff. We have established a quorum of five members and eight, eight members and five factions. Please let's stand for a moment of silence. I have received moments. Uh, I received notice of absence from the following members of Parliament: MP Akim Arundel, MP Sihart Bijlani, MP William Marlin, MP Christophe Emmanuel, MP Brown Bill, and MP Peterson. Are there any members of Parliament that wish to have the floor for notifications? I see no need and then we can go straight to the agenda points. We have four agenda points for this meeting, three agenda points. The first one, the first agenda point, is the draft national ordinance amending the national ordinance taxing business turnover in connection with the introduction of an exemption of psychologists. This can be found on the parliamentary year 2021 to 2022, number 158, and also on the IS-883, Parliamentary Year 2021-2022, dated May 11, 2022. The second agenda point for today is the draft national ordinance establishing the annual accounts of St. Martin for the financial year 2019. National ordinance establishing national accounts 2019. This can be found on the Parliamentary Year 2021-2022, number 159, and also on the IS-1119 Parliamentary Year 21-22, dated July 5th, 2022. And the third agenda point for this morning is the draft national ordinance establishing the annual accounts of St. Martin for the financial year 2020. National ordinance establishing annual accounts 2020. This can be find, found under Parliamentary Year 2021-2022, number 162, and IS-1170, Parliamentary Year 21-22, dated August 10, 2022. We go over to Agenda Point 1. Parliament received the draft national ordinance amending the national ordinance taxing business turnover in connection with the in introduction of an exemption psychologist on May 11, 2022. This document, as mentioned before, is registered on the IS-183 and dated May 11, 2022, and also on the parliamentary year 2021-2022, number 158, and can be found on the P drive. At this time, I would like to give the floor over to the Minister of Finance, Mr. Artwell Arian, for his opening remarks and presentation on Agenda Point 1. Minister, you have the floor. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning to the honorable members of parliament, support staff, colleagues, and the viewing audience. Madam Chair, I would like to take this opportunity to provide a short update on the Budget Amendment 2022. The amended budget is presently at the Council of Advice to be established. Once the advice is received by government, the NADA, the NADA report will be drafted and proceeded to come for approval, after which it will be sent to parliament via the governor at this moment, we are awaiting the advice from the Council of Advice in regards to Budget Amendment 2022. I'll now go over to the current agenda point, which is the draft national ordinance amending the national ordinance tax on business turnover in connection with the introduction of an exemption for psychologists. On sheet one, where's the what? The draft ordinance. It is a yes. The proposed amendment to the national ordinance tax on business turnover hereafter will be considered a TOT ordinance in connection with the introduction of a turnover ordinance exemption for psychologists. On 
Prior to expounding on the proposed amendment to the TOT ordinance, I would like to comment on the current TOT exemptions for hospitals, medical research laboratories, doctors, dentists, dental techni technicians, nurses, midwives, physiotherapists and remedial therapists, chiropractors, speech therapists, dietitians, and podiatrists. These exemptions are all, are all included in the Article 8, Paragraph 5 of the current TOT ordinance. The legislative history of the provision shows that the legislature has deliberately opted for an exhaustive enumeration of items mentioned therein. In other words, the legislature only wanted to grant a TOT exemption for those items and nothing more. Psychologists do not appear in the aforementioned exhaustive list. This means that the legislature has deliberately chosen not to exempt psychologists from TOT. However, in the following sheet, the specific legislative amendment and the reason to include psychologists will be mentioned. With the proposed amendment, it is proposed to amend the TOT ordinance by including psychologists in the exemptions of Article 8, Paragraph 5 of the TOT ordinance. As a result of Hurricanes Irma and Maria, the demand for psychologist services has increased. According to the healthcare sector, psychologists are in practice discouraged from settling in St. Martin due to the low remuneration and the levy of TOT on their services. The latter could possibly lead to a shortage of psychologists on the labor market. Considering the aforementioned arguments, it is proposed as a high exception to also exempt the services of psychologists by means of an amendment to Article 8 paragraph 5 of the TOT ordinance, where psychologists will also be included in the relevant exhaustive list. This means that the business turnover of psychologists relies as such exempt, is exempted from TOT from the moment the proposed amendment goes into effect. And with the following, this is a, a very short presentation, and we have come to the end of the presentation, and I look forward to your questions. <coughs> Thank you, Minister Edian, for your presentation. I see on the speakers list where we have a speaker would like to have the floor, and that is MP Rolando Bryson. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Good morning to you. Good morning to my colleague, members of Parliament, the Khafir, the Honorable Minister uh, with us today, as well as his support staff, and also those in the Tribune and following us by various media. Um, Madam Chair, I took note of the um, legislation before us, which is an amendment to the turnover tax law um, that would allow uh, psychologists to be exempted or, or added to the list of exemptions that already exist for some medical professionals. Um, Madam Chair, there was only one aspect of it that I would like some clarity on, which was also pointed out by the Council of Advice. Um, it appears that in the original legislation, it was stated that uh, psychologists, um, well, the motive of creating this law was to bring it in line to have all medical professionals have this sort of exemption. Um, however, what the Council of Advice noted is when they juxtaposed that list to the legislation uh, that outlines what medical professionals are considered in our law, they actually pointed out that, wait a minute, um, you didn't include all of them. So I think just some clarity from the minister as to why specifically psychologists and with this amendment, are all medical professionals now covered, or are there si still some uh, medical practitioners of any form that will be excluded, and maybe some plans to include that we cover all of them? So apothecaries, I don't know if they're included. Um, are uh, physiotherapists also uh, included in those exemptions? Just for completeness sake, that um, that part of the council advice remark is sufficiently addressed by the government. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Next on the speaker's list, we have MP Sarah Westcott-Williams. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. A good morning to you. A good morning to our support staff, my colleagues. A good morning to the minister and his support staff. A good morning to all tuned in to this Central Committee meeting of Parliament. Madam Chair, Lady, I want to thank the Minister of Finance for going into a topic that I raised in meetings this week, and that is the status of the draft amended budget 2022. From the minister's presentation, I learned that 
the draft budget 2022 is currently with the Council of Advice. And Madam Chair Lady, I want to ask the, the minister if he can provide a clearer timeline in terms of when the budget, when the parliament can look forward to receiving the amended budget 2022. Since we're talking about budget, Madam Chair Lady, and the, the minister was um, so nice to give an update on the status of the draft budget 2022, I would like to ask the minister if he, during his presence here, can explain um, the issue as well with respect to the CFT's reaction to the budget. Madam Chair Lady, I was um, under the impression that um, the government, the Minister of Finance, and the Prime Minister during a pr another meeting of Parliament indicated that they had received approval by the CFT regarding one, the draft budget 2022, amended budget that is, as well as for the paying out of the vacation allowance. If I read correctly, the letter that the state secretary sent to the second chamber, this particular issue is being contested. So the CFT's approval for the amended draft budget 2022 and the paying out of vacation allowance as done by the, by the government. So Madam Chair Lady, since the minister was so nice to give a response on the budget, maybe he could also explain um, that fact as well. Madam Chair Lady, now going over to the draft ordinance before us, and I want to thank the minister for finally presenting this amendment to the turnover tax. Madam Chair Lady, I have been, after having been approached by the Association of Psychologists and Allied Professionals um, regarding this matter, I have asked the minister about it on several occasions to learn that due to capacity and other reasons, this draft could not have come before. But better late than never, I must say, so um, thanks to the minister for finally dealing with the matter of the existing exclusion of psychologists from um, the exemptions on the turnover tax. A long sentence, but actually, while many of the medical professions, most of the medical professions, et cetera, are exempted based on the turnover tax law, it was until now, still is not a case for psychologists. But Madam Chair Lady, the argumentation used by the minister, um, I am interested in hearing more regarding that. The, the minister suggested in his brief presentation that psychologists will now be added under the exemptions of turnover tax in accordance with the turnover tax law. However, it is by means of high exception that this is done so if that, if I understood the minister correctly to say that as if it's like, okay, we're adding you in to the exemptions, you being the psychologist, but it's not, um, it's by means of ex exception, high exception. So Madam Chair Lady, I then would want to ask the minister if he can explain a little more the issue of um, these particular exemptions in general. So the article that deals with the exemption of the different medical practitioners and such. Because if the adding the psychologist is by, um, by high ex exception, then I would like to know what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's then the reasoning behind the overall um, exemption given to all of those to, to all of those persons. That's that's one, Madam Chair, Lady. In addition to that, the um, talking about taxes and changes to the tax system, the minister has on several occasions indicated several issues that um, 
that he wishes to pursue regarding changes to our tax system. And the last information that we got regarding the reforms to take place in the tax system, the minister said that that needed, there is a draft and that needed to be approved by the COM and then the, um, it will continue. So if the minister can give an update where the issue of the reforms to our tax system, a tax reform system, um, where that matter is at right now. Madam Chair, lady, I think with this information, I would have received sufficient information on this draft before us right now, and I thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott-Williams. Next, we have MP Ludmila Duncan. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. Good morning to you. Good morning to the minister and his support staff. Good morning to my colleagues and all those tuned in. I just had one question because the MPs before me uh, asked everything that I was thinking of um, is uh, just a number of private practice psychologists because we have psychologists working for the Mental Health Foundation. And so I'd like to know um, if the minister can provide a number of psychologists that have, let's say, private practice and how this would affect them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Duncan. I see MP Bryson want, would like to have the floor. MP Bryson? Yes. Also, one question I missed um, was related back to the council advice. Also, in um, in the legislation, I, sorry, yeah, in the explanatory memorandum of the legislation, one of the things I looked at is whenever you you change something to the tax law. Um, even in working, for example, in the, with the TOT tax law on the double taxation of fuel, one of the things in consultation with the legal uh, experts is that you want to look at what is the possible budgetary effect on the country. And in that section, um, it, it speaks of a challenge in getting that type of data um, in order to make such a determination. And that's actually also a challenge with any of the taxes that we want to uh, reduce or increase. Um, based on what we have here, it states that between the years of 2015 and 2018, um, the average uh, the average was 6,000 guilders per year in turnover tax, if I understand that correctly. Um, so that's based on very limited information. Uh, my question would be, what is the minister doing to try to improve the, that sort of information? So being able to segment by which sector you are collecting. So in, in the medical sector, we're collecting this. In fuel, we're collecting that. Um, and also, how did they come to this figure? And does that maybe give some doubt to the minister that, well, if it's only 6,000 guilders where we're, um, we've been collecting, um, does that then mean are we really losing out on much? But on the other hand, are psychologists really even saving much if that is the figure that we have here? Um, there is an estimation that it may be as much as 30,000 guilders a year, which is also in the explanatory memorandum. But just some explanations on those figures. What is maybe a more realistic savings that can be brought within the, psych the psychology sector um, as a result of this law? Thank you. Thank you, MP Bryson. I see MP Westcott-Williams have one more question. Stated. Yes, Madam Chair, Lady, and I thank you. And it ties into the question by the um, previous MP, MP Rolando Bryson. The, the matter of, because the question arose with respect to the uh, um, retroactive nature or not of this particular change. And then it sort of alludes to the fact that the, the psychologists and that group, not the psychologists, yes, and that group have not really been, or there's no information, or they have not really been living up to the, to the, to the draft. That is also sort of insinuated to not a draft, living up to the tax. So I would like the, um, the minister, if he could be a little, a little clearer and maybe go a little more in depth on, on that particular matter. So yeah, the amount is low that, the amount is low that has been estimated to be collected, but it also suggests that many of the persons who should have been filing um, have not for whatever reason. Is that really, is that really so is my, is my question to the minister in connection with that statement. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Is there any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor on this topic? I see no need. Then I turn the floor over to the minister. Minister, do you need some time to caucus internally? 
Yes, Madam Chair. I would mm -hmm. like to propose that it's possible to adjourn this agenda point and continue with the other agenda point while a portion of my staff uh, prepare those answers so we could continue with the meeting. Sure. Um, members of Parliament, are we okay with that uh, proposal by the Minister? Yes? Okay, good. So then meeting, then this agenda point is then adjourned. And then we go over to agenda point two. Do we have the presentation ready for agenda point two? I'll give... Uh, Alvin, a few seconds, and while he's doing that, I will then start informing everyone about agenda point two. Parliament received a draft national ordinance establishing the annual accounts of St. Martin for the financial year 2019 on July 5th, 2022. This document is registered as incoming document IS-1119. 2021-2022, dated July 5th, 2022, and can be also found on the parliamentary year 21 to 22, number 159, and again stated it can be found on the P drive. At this time, I would like to give the floor over to the Minister of Finance for his uh, opening remarks on this presentation and his presentation in general. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Same thing. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'm here to present the financial statements of St. Martin for the year 2019 and the year 2020. Minister? Not to interrupt you, do you want me to combine the two agenda points because we are 2019? What was one agenda point? Yes, can we the, combine The that? agenda point two is about 2019. Your presentation, I just realized, is both, both years. Members of Parliament, is it okay that we combine the agenda points? Uh, MP Bryson? Uh, Madam Chair, I think for the purpose of the presentation being both, I, I would agree that that's okay, but I do would propose that we keep it as two separate agenda points, being that it's two pieces of legislation. So then the questions posed today would be only on 2019, not today, at this point in time, will be only regarding 2019, yeah. and then we'll move over to agenda point uh, three. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Minister, you can proceed then with the presentation. The agenda is as follows. I'll start by providing insight into the income statement for the years 2019 and the year 2020 compared to the budget of that specific year. The income statement shows all the income generated and the expenses for the specific years. I will then speak on the balance sheet for the years 2019 and the years 2020. The balance sheet shows the assets and liabilities of St. Martin. I will touch on some highlights noted in the balance sheet for the specific years. In addition, I will provide you with some general highlights pertaining to both years, state the improvements and the achievements made, and lastly, provide you with some information of the financials of the year 2021. On slide three, you can see the actuals for the year 2019 compared to the budget 2019, and also the actuals for the year 2020 compared to the budget of that year. When looking at the income for both years, the taxes are both instances, some instances more than 20 million gills higher than the budgeted. Both years are particular years as 2019, the economy was picking up after Irma, but in contrary to 2020, we had to deal with the start of the pandemic. Even though in both years the actuals were higher than the budgeted amount in 2020, you can see a decrease of 50 million gilders of our tax income as a result of the pandemic. The total income declined with 64 million gilders from 452 million gilders in 2019 to 388 million gilders in 2020. When looking at the expenses for 2019 and 2020, the following is noted. For both years, the total expenses were below our budget. In 2019, there's a positive impairment of effective effect of 20 million caused by the positive effect of the valuation of the subsidiaries of government. However, in 2020, this declined and we had a negative impairment of 18 million guilders caused by effects of COVID. And the total expenses increased in 2020 compared to 2019 with 96 million guilders. Thus, a decline in revenue plus an increase of expenses in 2020 is the reason for an increase in the negative result to 180 million guilders 
in 2020 compared to the negative result of 20 million in 2019. Slide four. On slide four, the balance sheet for the years 2019 and 2020 is shown with the previous year for comparison purposes. The asset is shown above and the liabilities below. The biggest movements are mainly the equity, which is declining as a result of the negative results of the last years. Furthermore, an increase in the long-term debt as a result of liquidity support received in the form of loans. Our debt to GDP ratio, as stated in the latest IMF report, is estimated at 60% at the end of 2021. The restructuring of these loans and future payments has our attention. Slide five, some general highlights. For both years, Article 25 applied for the year 2019 due to after effects of Irma and Maria and in 2020 due to the pandemic. In 2020, we received liquidity support in the form of loans, which led to primary increase of long-term debt. On a positive note, in both 2019 and 2020, our income was higher than budgeted. The expenses were lower than budgeted in both years as well. However, in 2020, due to COVID, there was a significant increase of expenses with about 20, 96 million guilders. In a particular, one of these reasons were the SRP. The audit opinion received for both years was a disclaimer of opinion on the true and fair view of the financials and an adverse opinion on compliance. Slide six, the main improvements are improve of quality of the financial statements and have an up-to-date financials. The financial statement is not where they need to be as yet with regard to quality. However, we have made a lot of improvements which were also noted by the auditors and some include providing a lot more audit evidence to them which has assisted in them being able to execute the audit procedures, having more updated financials of the subsidiaries to assess the value of them the auditors having a contact person with the necessary technical and operational knowledge at their disposal, the positive effects of the cleanup project on the specific financial statements line items. We are currently up to date with the financials after completion of 2019 and 2020. Since I came into office, Madam Chair, I have made sure that the process was finalized for the years 2013 up until 2020. The financials for the years 2013 to 2016 were audited before I came in to office. However, the process was never completed, which consists up until making it a law. Having updated financials is a key in being able to hold government accountable as the financial statements show the actuals which can be compared with what was budgeted. Having financial statements discussed seven years after, after the year does not make sense as no one can be held accountable. And that is why it was my goal, and it is very important to me to get the financial statements of St. Martin up to date. In May 2022, the audit was finalized for the year 2020 annual report, and we are now discussing in Parliament three months later, which is how it should be, the 2022. And we have already drafted a financial report for the year 2021, which is also how it should be, and, which is, which, and also how we plan to have it continue in the future. Slide seven, which is also the final slide, Madam Chair. The process of compiling the financials for the year 2021 started in quarter two. Our deadline for handling the annual report in 2021 in calm is September 1st, 2022. We hope that this is timely, a timely trend that we hope to continue in the coming years, not only to be able to say that we are compliant with the law, however, also for timely accountability purposes. Lastly, the financial management clean the project led to a, led to yet more qualitative improvements in the 2021 financials, together with the other projects on the financial management, the goal is to continue increasing the quality of the financial statements for St. Martin. Madam um, Chair, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the questions from the members of Parliament. Thank you, Ministerian, for your presentation. I will now turn the floor over to members of Parliament, and just again, a friendly reminder that we pose the questions pertaining to 2019 budget, and I have not received any? Yes? And B. Bryson, we'd like to have the floor. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Good morning once again. 
Madam Chair, um, this is becoming a very familiar meeting for us in Parliament. Uh, this Parliament that has, took, that has uh, taken the oath since early 2020 to become members of Parliament has had multiple instances by which the current Minister of Finance has presented to the Parliament of St. Martin and uh, deliberated to which we have approved multiple financial statements from 2016, 17, 18, now 19, now 20, I would believe 2021 is probably being moved at, at the same expediency. And perhaps before the term of this parliament ends, we will have a 2022 account. Madam Chair, we, we take a lot of time to point out when ministers ain't doing this good or ain't doing that good, or when they're not complying with certain laws or, or, or whatever they think that we feel ministers and this government is not performing. Madam Chair, just to, for everybody to understand, the requirement of providing financial statements are not something that you can feel like doing or you want to do. This is something outlined in the National Ordinance of Compliance that state that financial statements must be delivered. And despite the fact that the minister came in, and from what I understand, it is from since 2016 those statements have not been issued, or was it even before that? If the minister can maybe clarify that timeline for us, so give a little recap on how many of those statements were addressed and how many of them um, were finally passed and ratified. Um, we have to take a moment, I think, to tell the minister congratulations on the effort, and as well as his ministry, the secretary general, and all of you for making this possible, because we're getting closer and closer to creating an actual budget cycle. And what I mean by that is, normally what we're supposed to do is get the financial statements, and then based on those financial statements, we then analyze the budget. You know, um, As a faction, we would sit together, maybe one part, and probably MP De Weaver would be the one to do that homework for me, which is then analyze the financial statements, and then I would like to tell the minister that, no, that budget post ain't no good, we gotta move this here, we gotta move that here, might be the one to then present amendments. That is really the role of parliament in its financial management. And I think the entire ministry, all of you that have been working, the SOAB, the General Audit Chamber, thank you for making that effort and showing the respect that parliament deserves to get these financial statements in order. Not coming in and saying, well, nobody else ain't do it before, so I'm going to just leave it alone. No, but taking the mantle by the horn and to me, showing the respect to the Parliament of St. Martin and recognizing that in order for us to do our proper financial due diligence and treat the budgetary cycle with the necessary legal respect, this is the steps that we have been needing. Um, Madam Chair, I... In looking at the financial statements, I will have to give credit where credit is due because um, I am not an auditor, I've, I've never been and would never want to be. And because when I look at this level of document, just to give an idea to the public what we're talking about, I believe it's over 300 and something pages of information, but very valuable information nonetheless. Um, I do have to thank MP Ludmila De Weaver for some guidance on how this, this auditing process is done and the meticulousness at which an entity like SOA Bay would go into something like this. And also, when I, when I hear it from that perspective, it gives me even higher appreciation for the amount of work and interaction that would have to go into place between the Ministry of Finance, the SOA Bay, the General Audit Chamber, and so on, because it's even more daunting a task than I even thought when I hear her describe what an auditing process can entail. Um, one of the things, though, that I even got some clarity on uh, from, from the MP is something that has always, from an English-speaking perspective, can be very confusing, which is the term, like the minister just used, a qualified or unqualified opinion. Because, let's say in English, if I just say this opinion is unqualified, you know, I'm going to say, but that opinion ain't no good. That don't sound right. Or if I read a headline in a newspaper and tomorrow the newspaper says, Minister receives unqualified opinion for audits, they go say, you see this area ain't no good. He you know what he's doing. Because in English, it sounds like it's not good. However, in the world of auditing, it appears that the unqualified opinion is the gold standard that you try to achieve in most cases. Now, I can imagine 
in the, the state that the country has been in over the time, be it because of political instability, be it because of ministers not addressing it properly, um, it would probably be very difficult to get such an unqualified opinion in financial statements that you're handling uh, much later on. So when I, when I did look at such the opinion of the SOAB, it reads here that these opinions, sorry, let me go to this part, our audit issued on February 23rd, 2022 on the 2019 financial statement re regarding, uh, with regard to the Khatrao hate aspect, we issued a disclaimer of opinion, ordeal on holding, with regard to the financiële rechtmatigheid aspect, and we have issued an adverse opinion, afkeurend. I mean, even this in Dutch and English can come across very confusing, so the minister maybe can uh, summarize for me what this is, but then also, what the SOAB says about it is that these opinions are due to the material uncertainties and errors noted during the audit, which are primarily caused by insufficient audit evidence, received deficiencies in the internal control procedures and deficiencies within IT, which we've heard many years in Parliament that these issues exist. But what I find very interesting about what the SOAB says, they acknowledge the following. Nevertheless, during the audit of the financial statements for the year 2019, we did note a major improvement as compared to 2018 and 2017. During this audit, we received more underlying audit evidence as compared to the previous years. We also had an appoint, uh, appointed contact person with the necessary technical and operational knowledge to whom we could both request audit evidence and pose necessary questions on which we received an answer in a timely manner. And it goes on. I think into maybe two pages highlighting those improvements. And Minister, I know you're not one to toot your own horn, but I think you need to highlight those improvements today for the members of parliament and the public. Highlight the fact that yes, we haven't gotten there yet, but very, very clear indications from the SOAB that major improvements have been made. And some of those are, are important for us to recognize as well. But Madam Chair, what is also interesting in this context, I mentioned the legal responsibility of the Parliament of St. Martin to see a situation like this, you know, and take it extremely seriously, that financial statements are a legal requirement. And what is also important to note, that there is a high council, a high council called the General Audit Chamber, that in 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, and probably maybe in 22, it's going to start to change. That has been telling the Parliament of St. Martin, this is a problem. This is a major deficiency. They've done investigations. They've sent reports. They've come to Parliament. And at that time, in those days, no consequences were bared upon any of those ministers, Madam Chair. A high council the high councils that we're supposed to respect. Minister, in the environment that we're in now, it is good that you handle this this way. Because I believe with the way some members of parliament have tried to use the high councils for when it's convenient to attack a minister, you would have been under those attacks now. Mind you, I just listed all those years where the general audit chamber, high council general audit chamber, has issued those reports with zero consequences to any of the ministers before. But this is why it's also important to ensure that you live up to those reports. And I believe you have. So I would like to ask, um, based on the, the information or recommendations, also not just from the SOIB, but now from the high council, the general audit chamber, how is the progress in implementing their recommendations in their report as well? They also list many of the improvements that you've seen under your time as Minister of Finance, um, but they still also each year um, give you recommendations. Are you implementing those recommendations? Are you respecting the opinion of the General Audit Chamber? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Next on the speakers list, we have MP Sarah Westcott-Williams. You are next on the floor. Thank you once again, Madam Chair, Lady, and I thank the Minister for, again, his very um, brief submission of the financials of the annual accounts of government for the years 2019 and 2020. 
Madam Chair Lady, I could dissect the advices received from the SOAB, the Internal Accountant of Government, and the General Audit Chamber. But I think in very important is and where do we stand today? While, Madam Chair Lady, um, both institutions have commended the minister and the ministry for catching up with the backlog, um, they have remained very critical of the process and um, the information provided. Both reports are very critical where that is concerned, and I repeat, while commending the minister for um, speeding up the backlog. So, Madam Chair, Lady, a very important part for Parliament to determine how the government has executed its task is looking at the intentions of government as expressed usually in the budget, and then how these intentions have been met financially. In given that explanation, I believe um, the government is, um, is short, has come up short. And it has also been acknowledged by the um, institutions I just mentioned who have provided advice on these um, on these accounts. So I would like to ask the minister where that is concerned. So very, very clearly, um, in these accounts, what we should be seeing are the policies slash policy intentions and how, if and how these have been executed and what are the financial implications of this execution. It is very, very difficult from what has been presented thus far to understand the policies as implemented. Yes, I, from the ministries we see, um, off the top of my head, let me think of one. So, anyhow, some policy of the government, and then it is mentioned, it's either a cross, didn't happen, a check mark, or it is pending slash current. So in this context, I don't know where these policies intentions come from. Where have they been taken from? Are they from the year plans of the ministries? Are they from the governing program? Are they from the budget? So very specifically to the minister. Minister for the different ministries where these policies are mentioned, where you see this is lopen, this didn't happen, and on and on and on and on. Where, have, where are these policies from, these specific directives? Where, where, where did they come from? Are they, they're, not, they're not tied to the budget, so you can't look at budget post this and say, well, this particular intention has been carried out, has been partially carried out, whatever the case may be. So in the annual accounts where in some cases for some ministries, policies are mentioned and an attempt has been made to give an update on the execution of these policies, where have they been taken from? Where do they, these policies come from? Madam Chair, Lady, the, the matter of government-owned companies remain and have remained a concern for advising agencies such as the SOAB and the General Accounting um, Chamber, Gen yeah, General Accounting Chamber. And I need to therefore ask, and in particular, coming back in these two accounts, is the, the harbor. And I would like to ask the minister to provide an update on the financials of government-owned entities. Where do they stand? What does the ministry have in terms of these financials? One, and what is the status of the harbor that continues to be cited as a, a sort of a risk for government? Madam Chair Lady, and while I hear a lot of um, a lot of commendations. Apparently, this particular exercise has been done 
by in consultation with the TWO. The Tijdelijke Werkorganisatie, which has been put in place to be the precursor of the COHO. So, Madam Chair Lady, I also read in these reports that what has been presented to Parliament right now is part of that, of that work method, is part of that organization, that collaboration, but um, this will not be the case for the 2021 account of government. So I would like to know through you, Madam Chair, Lady from the Minister, Minister, there was um, developed by the TWO, there was developed a plan of approach for study into reducing the turnaround time of the delivery and audit of the annual accounts of St. Martin. And like with these plans of approach, um, the reason why, and of course the, the backlog, et cetera, are mentioned, and the study, the study coming out of that particular country package item um, should have been completed by um, June 2022, according to reports. Was that done? Has this study into reducing the turnaround time of the delivery and audit of annual accounts of St. Martin, has it been completed? And um, if so, can it be shared with the parliament? So to find out, to, to see some of whatever the study has yielded in terms of getting the annual accounts of St. Martin up to date. Madam Chair Lady, the, the minister indicated that he would um, provide some updates with respect to 2021. Um, what the minister did say was that the drafted, the financials 2021 have been, have been drafted, meaning that they are at what stage at this time? Still with the ministry, have they been forwarded to the agencies and very specifically, given the constant recommendations by especially the general audit chamber, can the minister outline the improvements, if any, in the draft annual account 2021 vis-a-vis -vis those of 19 and of 2019, sorry, and 2000. 20. And then, how could we discuss annual accounts without getting, I would need that in any case, an update as to the current financial position of the government of St. Martin? The minister can provide, provide that as well. So, Madam Chair Lady, again, you know, we could, we could commend and we can raise the the annual accounts that we have before us, or we can go in and dissect it and find, in some cases, all that is said positive, and in the other case, all that is said negative. But, Madam Chair, Lady, I don't know. Not at least for me, that's not the purpose of these, um, of dealing with these these matters of annual account. Because at the end of the day, Madam Chair, Lady, with all that is stated, um, the General Audit Chamber recommends that the Parliament of Saint Martin gives discharge as far as these annual accounts are concerned. So let's, 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 put that, let's put that out there. That's what is being recommended. So while they are very critical in terms of the reports, et cetera, and as I said before, they have commended the fact that these, um, the ministry has been working on getting the backlog out of the way and being in compliance with the law and the dates where the annual accounts are concerned. However, in the overall picture, the recommendation to the Parliament of St. Martin is to give the, is to give the, the government slash the minister discharge. That's what we do after discussing and deliberating the annual accounts as presented by the 
as presented by the government. So, Madam Chair, lady, with those um, questions, I'm sure the minister and his staff um, has, them, has them noted. I am particularly interested in hearing where these policies that are mentioned for the different ministries, where have they been taken from? One, government entities, Harbour in particular, which keeps coming back in the annual um, statements of the government. If I can get um, more insight into 2021, what are the, what are the improvements um, in the draft financials for 2021, and then an overview of the current financial position of the government of St. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Next on the speaker's list, we have MP George Van der Flet. You have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to the Chair, my colleagues in Parliament, Honorable Minister and his support staff, persons that are viewing and are listening and to this um, meeting. Madam Chair, I too will be uh, commending the Minister and his cabinet. Um, definitely, it cannot be, uh, we cannot uh, do without saying that because the fact is, it is a reality. And one of the reasons, or one of the things I believe that the minister has been able to accomplish this is through not only his hard work along with the cabinet, but also the stability of government where there's continuation in order to get things done, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the minister mentioned something concerning the issue of loan restructuring. I say we'd love to see debt cancellation, but um, that's, that's a discussion I believe is ongoing. Um, colleagues before me said many things about the annual accounts already and questions have been posed. Something that I want to highlight and we're talking about financial accounts, taxes and so on, is the issue of inflation where the IMF mentioned in a report that they agree with government in canceling the 12.5% that has been deducted now from civil servants and also uh, those of the semi-private sector. Because this would mean, Madam Chair, uh, stronger purchasing power in order to buy more things which will turn over into revenues which will become taxes for government. So I think that we should very much get a support on that from all of us as members of parliament. Um, as I said, Madam Chair, questions were already posed that I wanted to pose and so on, so I'll await the answers, but I had to bring these two points out clearly because um, we, we, we fail to realize that everything is attached to each other. And if there's no continuity, then it's difficult to get things done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pandeflet. Next, we have MP Angelique Ramu. You have the floor. Pleasant good morning to you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you. And a pleasant good morning to my colleagues here this morning and also to the Honorable Minister and his support staff here this morning. I would also like to thank the Honorable Minister and his staff present here today for their presentation and also thank the Ministry for finally having up-to-date annual accounts. I would also like to commend all of the hard-working civil servants who have obviously worked tirelessly to have all of these years, to finally have these years up-to-date and getting us to this point, especially having done so in a pandemic. I also understand that the ministry is understaffed in the internal control department, and they are looking to fill these vacancies so that the financials can continue to be on time. For this, I do believe the ministry, civil servants, and the minister needs to be commended. I would also like to commend the minister for the good working relationship that has been established with the SOA Bay, as the minister mentioned in his presentation. And with that, I have one question because many questions have been posed already by my colleagues. And that question is, in what capacity has the TWO um, advised the minister as far as the finances, the financials are concerned? I thank you, Madam Chair Lee. Thank you, MP. I notice you have my name placed in front of you. <laughs> we need to change that, MP Ramu. <laughs> but thank you for your questions, MP Ramu. Uh, it seems that we came come to the ending of the um, question part.
part of this. Yes, okay. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Yes, Madam Chair. I almost forgot because MP Bijlani, as you know, um, is unable to be here due to medical reasons, but he did ask, ask me to relay one question to the Honorable uh, Minister through you. He asked that in the in 2019, other receivables, that, that line item, other receivables, was listed at 108.8, .8, and in 2020, that decreased to 53, which is a difference of 55.8 million, if the minister can give an explanation on that uh, sharp decrease in receivables. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Thank you, members of parliament, for all your questions. Oh, I see that MP De Weaver would like to have the floor. MP De Weaver. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. Good morning to you, my colleagues, Minister Finance and his team, the viewing and listening public. I uh, just a, just a brief comment, uh, kind of piggybacking on what was said earlier on. Um, while I thank MP Bryson for the compliments, um, I I wouldn't say. I wouldn't really go and say congratulations, not because I don't want to give Jack his jacket. What I will say instead is thank you um, to you and your staff because of the fact that you're just doing your job. That is the job of the Minister of Finance is to get this stuff together. So it's a thank you for doing exactly what you're here for. Um, with that being said, when I moved back to St. Martin in 2010, um, and of course started working with an external uh, financial auditor, uh, our main clients were government-owned companies. And you know, just sort of being uh, aware and current of what was going on on the island um, with the government, all I remember hearing was that government never had their financials up to date. That's all I heard when I was auditing government-owned companies, which had a, a sort of um, requirement by their financers that were off-island to get their stuff done Normally, our reporting for government from government-owned companies would be June. Uh, most of them would start getting fined uh, and penalties from external financers if they didn't have it in by their deadline for wherever in the world they were, usually around September. So here we are now, 12 years later, and it's omgekeerd. So now the Minister of Finance is getting the government up to track, but you have now, just as MP Westcott Williams earlier said, that the government-owned the government companies are lagging behind. So thank you again for doing your job. And I'm sending on a message via you, via the chair lady, to the Minister of Finance, um, to the rest of the government-owned companies, that they better catch up. So I hope that's all I had to say. Thank you again, Minister and your team for bringing this to the forefront and just continuing to do what every Minister of Finance sort of done before and should be doing in the future. And um, make sure the rest of the government-owned companies know that they better get on track. Thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP De Weaver. I see that MP Pandeblak would like to have the floor as well. MP yes, Madam Chair, just to be brief to piggyback back on what MP De Weaver said. I've been saying for years, Madam Chair, that we as government, our parliament government, doesn't have enough uh, 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 authority, I would say, as to what is happening with the government-owned companies. And I definitely agree with the, the, the MP because the fact is government-owned companies, the companies supposed to belong to the people. But some of them are behaving as if it's their own personal institution. So I definitely agree that it is time now that we put pressure on those government-owned companies to live up to their responsibilities because it is not their personal piggy bank. It is the people's company. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pantaflak. Just hopefully now appears that we have come to the end of this deliberation in the agenda point two. Uh, and any more, I don't see any more, uh, any other members of parliament wishing to have the floor for questions. Minister, should we take a brief adjournment or would you like to have the floor to respond? Minister? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, so we're still going to go over to agenda point three for 2020, 2020, 2020 um, annual count. Would you like for us to con move over to agenda point three to ask questions or you want to take a break? Some of the questions I think were kind of for both years still. Yes, I, <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> uh, um, so I just wanted a clarification on that. Do any member of parliament have questions for the 2022 budget? I see a few, yes. 
So yes, we do have that. So should 2020, yeah. uh, wait, we are in 2022. Yeah. But the 2020, so should we adjourn or no, should I'll, we? I'll make some um, brief remarks while okay. the team prepares other answers. Okay, then you um, continue. Yes, in regards to, first of all, I'd like to thank the members of parliament for their feedback, their comments, and uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, first, I'd like to I'll combine some of the questions together. Um, in regards, to, I'll start with first um, MP the Weaver, in regards to um, thanking me for doing my job. <laughs> um, I'll say we, I, um, I definitely appreciate that, but in addition to that, I would say it's not just doing our job um, as the Ministry of Finance, because our job is not to handle seven years of annual, annual accounts. So I, I think we have to take into consideration, too. Um, it, it was a lot of annual accounts within a, uh, the last two and a half years. Um, compressed in addition to dealing with a pandemic um, in the last two years. And fortunately, I mean, you were around when we were dealing with this. And um, I would like to also uh, comment on a com couple of comments from MP Angie Krimu and um, MP Sarah Williams that the staff that we have, um, as, as I mentioned, we are also on the staff in certain areas. We don't have a, a internal control. And a lot of the staff that we have are doing multiple roles. Um, the SG does multiple roles, the concern controller does, concern controller supports the SG, uh, the person at Treasury, uh, the same thing. So they're taking on a lot more roles than, they, than they're supposed to take on. And I want to uh, say that I appreciate them for that. Um, and I mean, even some more detail, you know, the concern controller came to work for her birthday. We had the SG left the hospital one day after he did surgery to come in to work on, on stuff. Um, to make sure that we stay on time. And I think that, that says a lot about the persons that work for us in the ministry. In addition to that, um, uh, the MP asked about uh, what was done in the past. I think in the past we, have a lot, we had a lot of neglect for our staff and dealing with the issues of why, why, why they're not able to produce on a certain level. For, um, uh, when it comes to, let's say, the ICT, the ICT, the equipment that they use, the software that we have is very dated. And we've updated some of these softwares currently so that we could reduce the stress on the staff to be able to produce to a certain level. And we continue to do that. There was also a remark on uh, Terry Yo's support, and I want to be very clear, MP Sarah Williams, Terry Yo didn't send anybody down here to help us on the annual accounts. Uh, that, that was all our people that did that. Uh, the only highlight we had in here with Terry Yo was support of um, financial to, to if we needed help externally. Every, the animal counts were done by us. Um, and even when we discuss the working relationship with SOAB, uh, as a government, we can't do this alone. We have to have a uh, good partnership with our partners. And um, with SOAB, we also did, um, dealt with their concerns. For example, the, with their backlog in payments, they, they had years of, they had a, a few, uh, a couple hundred thousand years of backlogs in payments, right? So executing work, but not being paid for their work, which is something we dealt with. Um, we even had a meeting with them yesterday where they thanked us for being, f for the first time in a long time, up to date with their payments, where they could continue to work structurally. Um, you also mentioned the MP Sarasco Williams, through your Madam Chair, um, the budget and policies, which I, I wish I, I could understand what, what, what your concerns in regards to we have a budget, we have policies, and are they aligned? And, when you look back in the financial statements and annual accounts, um, if we actually executed versus the policy. Even here, what we did is we uh, initiated with SYB uh, a policy-based budgeting um, program for, every, for all controllers in all the different ministries. Finance was the last one that's part of it because at the end of the day, we're asking some individuals maybe who don't understand what policy-based budgeting is to execute something. So we have done that and we'll continue to support in that area so that the future budgets could be a lot more aligned with our policies. It doesn't go down to details, for example, of how you can spend every single dime, but it gives a, a general description of, okay, this is the, this is the area we're going in. And, and also including that policy-based budgeting was that we have the governing program, we have the initiatives from the uh, ministries also and align all of this within the policies so that it can reflect um, in, in, when it comes to your execution. And that's something you'll also see specifically in the Budget Amendment 2022 when it comes to the capital expenditure, which I am, I am pretty hopeful 
that um, that will be funded for the first time in the last seven years. We haven't had CAPEX since 2014. And uh, when, the cap, when the capital expenditure first came to us uh, as a ministry, it was basically a wish list, right? It was just, we want this, right? We, where, and when we were, and especially myself, the certain ministries, uh, instructed the ministries to have more policy. Why do you need this, right? How you plan to spend this money? When you plan to spend the money? Based on what um, invoices and so forth, based on what advice? And the CAPEX was shrinked, but now we have a CAPEX that the CFT is also comfortable with saying, hey, you know what? This is how it should have been done all the time. So going back again to your question on policy-based on policy -based budgeting and so forth. So those will be reflected, um, some of it in the 2022 amendment, but also a lot more going forward. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but um, I do believe you see it a lot more based on the uh, approaches we are currently taking. And in regards to the financial statements from um, the, the government-owned companies, I do, and I can understand the question posed by MP DeWeaver. And um, when we look at the Netherlands, for example, all government-owned companies are, the finances are handled by the Minister of Finance, so all. And the policies, the execution, then handled by their, their respective and relevant ministers. And I have discussed with the Council of Ministers on um, this approach I believe we should also handle. Um, in the past, I have requested, for example, financials from an entity, and then they, they basically told me, I, I don't report to you, I report back to this minister, right? And then the minister comes back and asks me to still go back and check it. So it's like, okay, but I go to you directly, go to the minister, and then you come back to me. So we are addressing this. We're looking to have it as a, as a, a council of ministers decision to have all financials be handled by the minister of finance in annual accounts. And um, the policy and so forth then still um, is dealt with by the relevant minister because at the end of the day, it still comes back to us anyway. Um, we, and we also, because we have been, as a council of ministers, we have been putting more pressure on the entities to have up-to-date financials, right? So that we can also discuss, discuss them earlier and calm so that we don't have no rushed uh, um, requests to approve so that they can con continue the, the following years. So that concern, um, MPD Weaver, um, I hear you and I agree with you, and that is one of the, the, the areas that we are looking at of taking our responsibility as the Ministry of Finance and saying, look, we're gonna handle this and we'll keep the entities up to date um, with requests on the financials and the budget and so forth. And then we are, what we also do is that we translate it for the Council of Ministers so that they say, look, we, are, we agree with this or we don't agree with this, we bring the questions there before the shareholders meet in. So um, those are the concerns that um, I could have answered briefly off the top of my head, and I believe, did they update? Do we have um, five minutes to discuss how much time we need for, I hope you go to the next agenda point. What we can do, Minister, is um, we're gonna still have to adjourn this um, agenda point. Yes. So I'll take this opportunity now to adjourn the agenda point and adjourn for five minutes as well for us to start with agenda point three. No, you, you can start agenda point three. But I still need a five minute oh, you. adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> really need it. <laughs> so with that, members of parliament, I adjourn agenda point two and we also take a five minute uh, break and uh, meeting adjourned for five minutes.
Welcome back, members of parliament. We just took a brief adjournment. We uh, earlier, we adjourned agenda point two, and now we're gonna be moving over to agenda point three. And here goes. Parliament received the draft national ordinance establishing the annual accounts of St. Martin for the financial year 2020 on August 10, 2022. This document is registered as incoming document IS1170 and can be found on the parliamentary year 2021 until 2022, dated August 10, 2022. And it can also be found on the parliamentary year 21 to 2022 and under number 162 on the P drive. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to the members of parliament that wish to ask questions pertaining to budget 2020. Which member of parliament would like to have the floor on this topic? 2020, yes, yes, <laughs> budget amendment. Yes, MP Bryson, you did, okay. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning once again. Um, Madam Chair, before I go into the, um, the topic here, just a bit of a technical issue that maybe I want to point out to the, uh, the, the Hrifi. Um, normally, uh, the documents that we get, especially large documents, uh, when they're scanned, they actually somehow within the system, are sti they still become searchable. Um, unfortunately, in, with reg in 1170, which is the document um, that has uh, 214 pages, the large documents, so not the law. Um, that document was scanned and it's not uh, in a searchable form. I don't know if that uh, was something that, was that? No, no, so what I mean is, uh, sometimes the, the if you would scan the documents and despite it being a scanned, somehow in your system, you could still search it as if it's words. But in this document, it's saved as images. So we can't hit Control F and search through the document. That's what I, just so that maybe, maybe even by the public meeting, if something like that can be rectified, because it's very helpful, especially in large documents, um, to be able to search through. I, yes, Madam Chair? Yeah, OK. Um, I'm sure they, they, it's maybe just a, a slight oversight, so no biggie. But if maybe before the public meeting, in case I want to search through the document more thoroughly, that I can um, have that if that can be re-uploaded somehow. Uh, Madam Chair, the, when I heard the discussions actually with regards to uh, the financial statements, not just of government or government-owned entities, um, the minister seems to be ahead of exactly what I was thinking to suggest. Um, considering all of the improvements that are being made within the Ministry of Finance and the Civil Service in their ability to um, handle financial statements so well, um, has the minister concern, uh, considered centralizing the handling of all financial statements to government-related entities? But the minister did answer that, that that would be something, I guess, is up for discussion in the Council of Ministers. But I would definitely subscribe to something like that, where there's a centralized entity. Uh, it's very unfortunate to hear the conversation of, of, of a government-owned entity you know, basically brushing off the minister of finance. Um, but if you need to kind of issue either by decree or, or whatever legal means you have to ensure that sort of compliance, um, then I would recommend the minister do so. Um, but it does give a picture into the challenges that the, the government has had with these entities, as MP Pantaflet mentioned, that just feel that it's their own. It's their own and, and um, you know, I will say one entity that I know is notorious for that, which is the Bureau Telecom and Post, um, which, interestingly enough, um, that entity, it is very clear in the national ordinance that Every single cent that the BTP collects outside of operational cost is to be deposited to the government of St. Martin. That's, that's the only entity in our entire public service that actually has that in their legislation. So the airport, the government can't say, well, the airport, if you make 10 million guilders, you got to come, you know, profit 10 million, the 10 million goes to the government. No, they can still say, no, well, we'll pay a dividend of 2 million because we plan to invest this way and that way. But the BTP in the legislation, it states they are basically a cashier. And it's important to find out, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned before that it, it's, it's great strides that our ministers have made in terms of the accountability on that, um, in terms of the audits on it, but what about the money actually coming to the government? Where are we with that, particularly with BTP? Have you received, uh, Madam Chair, through you, has the government received deposits of currency from the Bureau of Telecom and Post? Um, Madam Chair, <clears throat> You know, coming back to another uh, 
English word that seems to have two completely different meanings in the word in, in the English word and the, the 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 auditing world, so to speak, is the term discharge. Um, I remember reading in the audit report of the General Audit Chamber where it talks about a recommendation to discharge. And I said, oh, Lord, here goes another high council want us to discharge a minister. But actually what we found is that the discharge is related to the duties and the liability and so on of a minister that they have analyzed this sufficiently to say, you know what, um, we know there are some deficiencies. We've seen those improvements, but we're making a recommendation to the parliament to discharge um, any sort of, uh, uh, um, let's say, discharge from the duty, well, let me don't say the duty, from the fact that although it might be an unqualified opinion, we do think that the statement as it suffices. And that is the recommendation that you have in the General Audit Chamber, specifically for 2020's financial statements. I would like to know how much is, did the pandemic um, weigh in to to that aspect. So I, I remember in 2017, there was a similar statement in the General Audit Chamber's accounts as well, that you know in 2017 was a year that you had a hurricane, 2020 was a clear challenging year for us due to the pandemic. How much of that weighed into um, the auditors kind of saying, listen government, we understand the challenges that you faced in 2020, so we understand that there may be some deficiencies within your financial statements. Um, Madam Chair, also, the, the minister mentioned about uh, capacity, and this is always a topic with many of, of the ministers and the ministries as well. Um, this is important for the minister to be able to um, be able to have the ministry do the work that it needs to do. But something that we never think about with the capacity issues in government is what that does to their fellow civil servants. Because oftentimes, if you don't have full capacity within, let's say, the Ministry of, of Finance or within those de relevant departments, that the workload on those individual civil servants, the stress on them and so on, is so much more. So when you see ministers saying, listen, please come and apply, let's do job mixers, let's open these positions, fill the critical vacancies. It is not just about the minister trying to get people into the ministry to get jobs. It is also intended, I would think, to relieve the civil service and give them some breathing room to say, okay, now that I'm not acting this, acting that, acting this, I can just focus on my actual function, which improves the functioning of the entire ministry. Um, so I would like to know what the progress has been on that. The minister has probably taken note of the, the motion passed by Parliament, particularly with regards to critical vacancies. What I would like the minister to tell us is uh, where are we in terms of the number of critical vacancies that he has filled versus what are open, and just in general within the ministry, if a number can be provided, these are the number of FTEs, these are the number that are filled. And what are the challenges? Are you still having challenges with the, the personnel department in terms of the expediency by which these advices go through? I remember once the minister, uh, we actually had uh, a technical briefing with a civil servant that took over a year. Let's say the process by, from which she did her first interview until she fought, started serving, an entire year would pass, you know? And, and I can't imagine how a government is able to function. A lot of that can't be in the hands of the Ministry of Finance. So the only other ministry I can look at is the Ministry of Personnel Affairs. And I don't know if the minister can at least comment a little bit on what the challenges are in that regard as well. Madam Chair, with regards to the, um, the actual, uh, the uh, actually now going to like the balance sheet. One of the things that kind of jumped out at me is um, this question that was also raised by the General Audit Chamber. It states, the liability for the cost of living supplement of 122 million guilders that will be dispersed in the future was not recorded as a provision in the balance sheet. I would like to understand what is that referring to, a cost of living supplement? I don't know if that's a cost of living adjustment, um, but that is a very, very large number. Is it indeed a liability? Are we saying that that should be a debt on the books of government? How do we view that, and how do we actually um, deal with that reality if it is indeed such a large liability? And what are the risks of having such a liability in your books? Another point that um, I want to raise, this uh, really applies to all of the financial statements, but I figured I'll address it in the 2020. Um, the debt to APS. Um, where is the minister in, uh, in handling or any discussions on, because I know in the past it was even a question of what that debt really is. You know, APS is saying one thing, the government is saying another. 
Um, yes, it's a government-owned entity, but just because it's a government-owned entity, you're not just going to let them come and say, you owe us $100 million or you owe us $200 million. I would expect the minister needs to do his due diligence to say, no, hold on, uh, you're a government-owned entity, we know you owe your money, but that figure that you're throwing at me is not correct. So um, I would hope the minister, if he can comment that he is, together with his ministry, really going through a fine-tooth comb to ensure that we're not overpaying or overspending on, in any regard with regards to our debt to APS and any plans uh, to be able to deal with that debt. Um, one of the proposals from MP William Marlin, for example, was, you know, can we consider via that debt doing similar to what um, he was instrumental in, in allowing that government building that was empty for so long, together with the APS and SZV, some sort of construct like that. Are there any suggestions that the minister has um, to help us, that it, that it doesn't have to be that a wire transfer necessarily goes to the APS for a debt, but some sort of other creative solution is done to deal with that debt that still is on the balance of our financial statements in 2020. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Next on the speaker's list, we have MP Sarah Westcott-Williams. You have the floor. I thank you once again, Madam Chair Lady. Madam Chair Lady, I can be very brief because, indeed, I was one of those who actually combined the, um, the questions and my questions that I posed under the agenda point, while I agree they need to be separated because of the legislative process, um, apply to 2020 draft annual accounts as well. So the same questions I had, I would like the minister, the minister to, to address. Madam Chair Lady, in briefly responding, the minister went into the matter of the collaboration. The minister was quick to point out that where the annual accounts are concerned, the temporary work organization um, had, didn't, didn't provide um, manpower, didn't provide, yeah, hands, manpower. And um, Madam Chair Lady, I, I need to, I need to, I need a minister still to go into I, um, this collaboration with the, with the TWO. Um, yeah, for the annual accounts, according to the country package, that's a St. Martin responsibility. So it's filled in, St. Martin needs to get the backlog up to date, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some other issues where it is mentioned um, these items will be carried out between St. Martin and the Netherlands. And I would like the minister to provide some, again, some insight into how those type of processes work, and especially where the financial component of these items are concerned. So for example, if it is mentioned this item in the country package under your chapter, and it is stated it will be executed by St. Martin and the Netherlands, and a study or something of the sort is to be commissioned, um, how does that take place financially? How does it take place? Does the, the ministry or the government have anything to say or to, 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 to do with respect to the outsourcing of whatever it, it, it is? Um, question one, regarding the TWO and the collaboration between the, um, the government and the TWO. In addition to that, Madam Chair Lady, the, the TWO, the precursor of the COHO, um, apparently has completed several, several road maps, several studies, several plans of action. What, what, what status does or do these types of, of documents have? What are they? Internal policies? Are they things that would have to be legislated eventually? So what, what, what status? You, I can imagine that as a, as a ministry, as some departments, I mean, you are now with all of these roadmaps and plans of approach in front of you to execute certain tasks. So what I, I, I need to get a clearer understanding, Madam Chair Lady, as to how this matter of the temporary work organization in practice works out. And when we read all of these summaries and things that are, um, that are made and, 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 and drafted, and what, what, does the, what, does the, what does the government, what does the government um, do with it? Because, Madam Chair Lady, the, uh, to, give a, to give an example of what I'm talking about, it was agreed 
by the government and the, 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 the Dutch government under the auspices of the TWO, for example, to do an educational review. I, I'm, I'm going to give this example so that the minister understand what, what I'm trying to get at. To do an educational review. That review was done. An interim report on the educational review um, was submitted to Parliament by the Ministry during recess. However, with no, with no kind of elucidation question as to what is expected of Parliament on this, and then in the last press briefing, I heard the Minister say that the Ministry will now prepare a comparative analysis a comparative analysis based on the educational review that took place. So I'm asking myself, where do these type of things, also for the Ministry of Finance, where their chapter is concerned in the country package, one, where do they come together? And the financial part, I, I want to know because I, I, have, I have had, I still have my concerns with respect to the general feeling of the coho um, throwing money at these different things that need to be done. And I don't really see it happening that way. I, I await with much interest the draft amended budget 2022. But so now some of the, the chickens are coming home to roost in terms of, you know, um, producing, producing the different documentation and plans of approach and whatever and whatever have you. So I am, I am, I am curious if the minister could, could go a little more in the workings of the TWO and the government. That, that collaboration, I, I would like to see it um, spelled out. Otherwise than that, Madam Chair, Lady, the, the, um, with respect to the different tying into my previous point, with respect to the financial improvements, there are many projects that fall under financial improvements. Um, what is the status of those, those items? What is the status of that work as far as the financial improvements of government is con are concerned? Other than that, Madam Chair, Lady, my questions with respect to um, government-owned entities, et cetera, updated um, financial information regarding the, the, the government of St. Martin. Um, those things are also for 2020. In fact, they sh they're more appropriate for 2020 because that's the latest draft annual account that we have. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. I see MP Bryson would like to have the floor. MP Bryson. Madam Chair, thank you, and I would like to have a follow-up question because um, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that is the intention of anyone in Parliament, um, but before any sort of impression is given that the Parliament or members of Parliament are questioning whether financial statements in this country can be handled by we ourselves, by our own, and what the role of the Tereos is or not, I have a simple question for the Minister. With or without a Tereo, with or without a coho, does the minister believe he can continue the track that he is on now, which is to ensure that budgets are here on time, that financial statements are here on time, with or without them, that the manpower and the people that we have, despite the fact that you're still working on, on getting these FTEs filled and so on, that the people within the ministry, that they have the capability, with or without a teweyo, a coho, a che, or whoever, to get the job done. Because I want to make sure that credit is given where it is due. It is not necessarily like MP De Weaver say about congratulating you, but about acknowledging that exactly what we've been saying, that if you put your minds to it and you manage your ministry the right way, we can handle our own affairs. That what has been done in the past has nothing to do about whether we needed assistance from the Netherlands. So just specifically on that point, is the minister prepared to continue on this track with or without such assistance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Is there any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor for this agenda point? I see that's it, no need. Then members of parliament, we have come then to the end of the deliberation, not the end, but I mean end of the questioning hour of this agenda point. Minister, would you like to take uh, an adjournment to go over? Or your Closing um, some remarks before we adjourn, um, Minister. Like the 
Like yes. the previous agenda point, I'd like to just um, briefly address some concerns sure. from the MPs um, that I have noted. I will start first with, um, in regards to hiring MP Bryson, um, I don't believe you've hired in by finance recently. Um, so in, in hiring, no, we are looking at that as, as was mentioned by MP Ramu. Um, internal control, that's a, an area that we, we are looking to try and fill, um, area that is very important to us, especially for our annual accounts and so forth. Um, in regards to hiring, I'll, I'll also go back, refer back to the job mixer that myself and the Ministry of Brummie had. I know they are uh, more on track in terms of um, maybe that process. They've had a, a few interviews and so forth already. Um, so I think that was a very uh, big success in regards to having a lot more interviews done and a lot more jobs. Um, at one point in time, instead of every three weeks, or every month, a new ad goes out. So I think in regards to job, in the job mixer, we'll see by the end of this year, the effects of that, of having something like that done, where a lot of questions could be answered already. Um, you have a, a whole list of individuals that have applied. But oh, in addition to that, what we, what we did do with the Ministry of Finance is we looked at some of the resumes maybe that didn't necessarily meet the criteria, the qualifications for specific jobs, but um, we advised them to look, apply for um, some temporary work that we had at, um, uh, uh, at, the, tax, at the tax department. So we had um, temp, temp, temp jobs, and some of those individuals did apply in that area, and they were hired for, um, we have a project that's run for about 18 months, um, they apply to those uh, vacancies. So the job mixer helps, and not just for the specific jobs with government, but also in addition to the temporary jobs that we had, we looked at those resumes and gave, um, gave preference to those. Uh, in regards to the amount owed to SV, APS, and so forth, um, you are right, we even have an SOIB report on this, where it's basically said, to us that government and SV, for example, you guys have to conclude this, right? Because there's not enough um, data information to come to have a hard fact on this is the amount owed. So myself and the director of SV and SV in general, I guess, also the CFO and so forth, and my cabinet, we have been um, in discussion on coming to a, a final a final number, right? So that those discussions uh, are progressing. But in addition to that. Um, in regards to having creative ways of, of paying off the debt and so forth. That's one area that we looked at. I mean, SV um, is potentially moving to um, a new home in Cahill. Um, I believe SV pays about $2 million a year in rent, so they're looking to go with a new home, but not also a new home, but a, more, a building that suits the future of SV. And basically there we are looking at, like you mentioned, ways of saying, look, okay, then you could prepay um, 60 years of long lease, and then that would then be subtracted from the debt owed and so forth after we have that, that, that figure. So those are areas, those are things that we are doing to be able to lower our, our, our debt to these entities. Um, yes, in regards to um, the TWO and animal accounts and so forth, I'll say this, we, we do have a good working relationship, I would say, with our counterparts at the TWO, right? And that started because we set, we, as, and I, I keep stressing too, even the council ministers now also, but also to my staff, that we determine what we want to do. The TWO is here to support us, so I, I don't want to hear, oh, TWO is here, we have to do this. No, we want to do this, and you help support us to get, get, get us there also with, with the financials. Um, there's also, there, was art, there was an article out about two weeks ago, I believe, from, from Basic, I believe, uh, where they mentioned, they gave a general synopsis of how is the working relationship is going with Simatin and, and the TWO. But I did ask them to specifically pull out the Ministry of Finance, and because uh, I think we, we are more of the leaders and we have the biggest uh, uh, projects, and write about that. Right? Write, write about that, let, let us send to Parliament so you can see the progress we have done, right? Not just in comparison to Simatin, but all the other islands also, Aruba and Curacao. Because um, the words that they had were very positive in regards to um, the Ministry of Finance being an example of um, how we should work together going forward on collabor collaborative projects between the Netherlands and um, the islands. And um, when it comes to annual accounts, we started this before TWO existed, right? I came in 
to government. Um, I read the remarks on Eswabe, um, and um, the general audit chamber, and um, even uh, I'll say this, and she probably would even our current member of CFD, right, um, Julissa, when she worked uh, for the ministry, she was stressing the hammer on these items being done, and um, she hopes that now that I'm here, that we'll actually get these things done and have them up to, up to date, right? And um, that process started way before the, the TBO, and that's, that was um, the ambition of the ministry on its own. So yes, um, that's something that we will continue. And I hope that, that that's um, a culture that we are, we're going to develop, even if I'm not there, that, that we continue to have these reports on time. Um, the question from MP Sarah Scott Williams, three Madam Chair, in regards, I think I briefly mentioned about the, the, no, the working relationship with the T TWO, and uh, MP asks about the financing. The financing, we, happens through um, basically a subsidy. Basically, they're, they're subsidizing certain projects, basically. Um, and recently, I also, and that, that's one of the issues we've, we've had in the last two years, um, dealing with the table and so forth, is, okay, we have a project, um, but how much are you going to finance, right? Sometimes it's, no, you, you finance up to your budget, and we'll support you, and so forth. Um, so the last two years, I would say, we've been grinding down to, okay, let's establish exactly what you're going to handle, what we're going to handle, and how it's going to be financed. Because I also, I also, even up to two weeks ago, we had a meeting with them, and I told them, listen, guys, I need to know how you plan to finance this, because I want to put it in my budget 2023, right? I want to operate properly, right? And I said, look, give an estimate at least of, of a budget so we can put it in the budget for 2023, because so, that's how it's supposed to be done. Right, that you have a budget there, and that we know this is where the money comes from to support these projects. So, um, in regards to financing, that's how that's how that works, and um, the collaboration. Um, I can't speak for every other minister or every other ministry. I do stress to all ministries and ministers that um, I, I don't believe in micromanaging, but I do believe in the minister being actively involved in these discussions with the TWO and taking the lead on these projects, right? Not even to have, let's say, not, not that uh, the, T the TWO does this, but you or your top staff take the lead on these projects so that your vision and um, according to the, also the, the government program and so forth is executed. Right, so that we don't, not that you have a monthly thing so you're surprised about this, no. So ministers, I believe, should be actively involved and in taking the lead on these projects, which I which I try my best to do it in my within my ministry, um, or make sure that the persons that that work under me, that they they know what I expect and that they execute this and have these discussions and that no final decision is made without um, coming back to the minister, and I think that has helped a lot um, within the last two years to, to, in making sure that. Um, yes, we are supported, but supported with our vision, the same Martin vision. Um, for the rest, Madam Chair, I believe we need about 45 minutes to an hour, but that was about 20 minutes ago, so 45 minutes. Yes, that's, uh, that's okay. Um, Minister, we can take a, uh, an adjournment until 2 p.m., and then we can maybe take a lunch break. Uh, yes, MP, what's that? Uh, Madam Chair, lady, I just want to understand the... Uh, Continuation of this meeting. Um, this is a central committee meeting handling um, draft legislation, and um, we would need to have a report with answers from yes. the, the, the government. So I'm just making sure, even if the minister comes back in 45 minutes, Correct. that we need to receive that report. Of from the, okay, just making sure that we are on the on the same. Yes trajectory. Thank you. Not a problem, MP. Uh, Minister, so we will then take an um, adjournment for until 2 p.m., take a, like a, a long a lunch break, and then we will return with the ministers with the answers to the questions posed in both agenda point one, two, and three. I think you didn't answer everything in three, right? So then we will adjourn agenda point three for now, adjourn this meeting until 2 p.m., and begin again with agenda point one, two, and three with the answers. Members of Parliament, this meeting is adjourned until 2 p.m. <laughs>